Mubarak, um, uh, Mubarak night, and today is, of course, the day of the 27th. So, alhamdulillah, may Allah accept from all of us uh, our ibadah, whatever we gave, inshallah, for his sake, may he accept it. Um, with that said, I uh, wanted to just also welcome, there are, I, I, today I did a, something a little different. I have some friends hopefully joining me here on Instagram Live as well. I thought, why not um, try this out? I'm not a multitasker when it comes to these kinds of things, but today seemed a little easier to do. Just hit the live button on Instagram. Um, but I'm for those of you who are watching on Instagram, I'm with the Rahma Foundation. We are doing a class called the Foundations of the Spiritual Path. If you go to my link tree on Instagram, I want to thank uh, Brother Omar for pointing it out to me that I had posted it there. You will see the link for to register. It's free. Anyone can tune in if you want to join the actual broadcast happening. You can register for that because we're going to continue even inshallah after Ramadan. So this class is basically on this document. It's an incredible document translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, but it's by written by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. Um, and so we have been going through this for several weeks now. I think this is our fourth session or third, I can't remember, but alhamdulillah, um, I'm very excited to continue this text. So we begin inshallah first with our dua. So we're going to do our dua together and then I'll jump into the text. But again, for those who are on uh, Instagram, you might want to come on the Zoom call because there's a lot of visual um, stuff here to look at. So hopefully it'll help you to follow along. Um, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughriqa wal khatima lima sabaqa nasir al-haqi bil-haqi al-hadi ila suratik al-mustaqim wa ala alihi al-haqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-azim. Allahumma iftah alayna futuh al-arifin wa wafiqna tawfiq al-salihin wa anfa'na Allahumma bil-Qur'ani wa dhikri al-Hakim. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman yuqarribuna minka birahmatika ya arhama ar-Rahimin. اللهم لا سهلا لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم وتجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله again بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم everyone we're going to now begin the text or reading the text. So I just wanted to actually share with you something that I worked on just a little while ago. I thought for those of us who are visual learners, this may further help to kind of see what we're doing here. So I'm going to screen share. Um, actually, I should just put this in the same tab so I don't have to keep going back and forth. Hang on one second. Let me add this to the same tab. And then that makes my sharing um, a lot easier to do, inshallah. Okay, so what I have done here is, because as I've mentioned, I say it all the time, but it's true. I am a visual learner. I like to just see things. So this is um, how, when I imagine reading this text, this is how I'm reading it, right? That we started off defining what the foundations of the spiritual path are, according to Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, who uh, gave us, mashallah, so much content and rich insight into how to really be on a path, right? If you, if we want to take our path seriously, which inshallah we all do, I mean, we're here, alhamdulillah, we're in the month, the blessed month of Ramadan, inshallah, we're fasting, we're praying, we're doing uh, our Quran recitation, our dhikr, our charity, we're doing all the things that we should be doing every day of the year, because that is the purpose with which we were existed, uh, which we were brought into existence, excuse me, which is to worship Allah. So all of these things we're doing, and it's being facilitated for us and if we want to sustain this path, right, because that's what we're, these are the conversations we need to start having. How can we keep this momentum going? Then we need to really see it as clearly explained to us what the ask is. And the ask, which of course is, you know, benefiting us and only us, is that we uh, take seriously our, our path, uh, our spiritual path, and we start to build upon it. But in order to do that, we have to first lay the foundation. So that's what Sidi Ahmed Zaruk has done. He's given us here the uh, the five uh, foundations, which are taqwa, right? Being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, you know, I'm just giving those summary points for us all to kind of, again, um, you know, bring full circle what we're doing here. But to be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in private and in public, right? So that's the uh, condition. There's, these are all conditional that we have to have taqwa consistently. We also have to practice the sunnah consistently in both word and action. We can't just, you know, teach uh, or 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 share uh, the the beauty of the Prophet character and his sirah without acting upon it, right? That would be a huge fail. 
Um, and, and it would be actually a sign of ingratitude, right? To acknowledge on one hand uh, that he is the perfect role model and the exemplar, but then to not even embody it, it doesn't make you very convincing, right? It doesn't make you convincing at all. So we have to put it into practice. And then indifference to whether or not people accept you or reject you. This is really important, given the context that many of us may find ourselves today, where social pressure actually uh, really does inform a lot of our decisions, right? Many people are afraid to uh, disappoint people, whether it's their you know, family or you know, people in their immediate circle or outside of, you know, in professional circles, wherever they go, there's a lot of uh, these things that people are factoring into their choices and decisions. But in order to be sincere on the path, you have to completely um, abandon that idea of letting the people dictate to you uh, and really thinking more about what is in your best interest in terms of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the creation becomes irrelevant, right? It's about the creator. Um, and then contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever difficulty you find yourself, whatever you know situation you find yourself, whether it's in times of prosperity or in times of hardship, that you have a consistent rida uh, with Allah, that you do not allow life circumstances to turn your heart this way or that way from Allah, but that you understand it's all from him. The blessings are for him, from him, the tests are from him, right? So your loyalty, your fidelity, your love, your devotion, your reverence to Allah remains the same, undisturbed uh, regardless of what's happening to you. And then the fifth point is reliance, right? That your default setting is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are in times of ad adversity or difficulty and in times of prosperity. And this last point is really important because I think it's easy for us to turn to Allah when we feel helpless and, and, and sometimes even hopeless. That may uh, just be natural, right? We're inclined to do that because what other means do we have? But when Allah is telling us that in times of prosperity and abundance, we should actually be turning to him, this is, I think, sometimes lost on us because we're easily distracted by dunya and ease and comfort and luxury and all the things that we enjoy, that we forget that it is those acts of uh, devotion, those, you know, the, the things that we do consistently that are um, really giving us the reserves that we need when things get bad, right? So we're kind of, we're stockpiling, we're adding, we're building the reserves because spiritual reserves are necessary. We should constantly be looking to try to fortify ourselves. Uh, life hits people very hard. I just spoke to someone earlier on a clubhouse call who uh, lost her father, um, Allah Arhamhu, to an, a car accident just 10 days ago, sudden, sudden death. I mean, subhanAllah, um, taken in, the, in this blessed month of Ramadan, uh, of course, and inshallah, we pray that he is accepted as a shaheed. But regardless, it is still very difficult for the, the bereaved to process a, a death like that. But if you've been doing your work, right, spiritually, consistently, every day, day in and day out, doing your prayers, reading your Quran, doing your dhikr, reading the stories from the Quran, turning to the book of Allah, then those, when those events, if those events are decreed for you, when they happen, inshallah, you'll be able to stand, you'll be able to have that, that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that necessary strength to endure. So this, these are the five foundations. And then if you remember, we've, we've talked about these again, for those of you who've been consistently coming every week, but we talked about how to, uh, what are the prerequisites of getting there? How can we even achieve this? It seems uh, maybe too, too uh, difficult, but it's not subhanAllah, because again, our amazing scholars have given us the details or the, or the prerequisites, they've, they've outlined it for us. So exalted aspirations, right? Allah's reverence, service, khidmah, completing our resolves. If you have a goal, you actually see it through. And then being in a constant state of gratitude, magnifying your blessings. So these are the ways with which we can at least uh, aspire to those five foundations. And then all of that, right, requires proper conduct. So I just love the way that this is structured and it really helps us to understand so that we can see and visualize where are we missing? Where are the gaps? What do, what do I need to work on, right? So the proper conduct is in and of itself its own foundation, right? And that's why you, when you, as you read the text, this is how you want to understand it. It's like levels, right? The highest level are, are the foundations, right? 
and we, because of our state and the, and the time that we're in, we're, we have to work on the on the lower levels. We're, we're, we need to go all the way back to the to the original steps, you know, before we can even begin to get to the foundations and then build and beautify and build upon that. So this is how we're working. So the proper conduct, he's also helped to um, to uh, to elucidate, like, what does that mean? Well, how do you get to proper conduct? You have to seek knowledge. You have to know what proper conduct is. You can't have proper conduct without knowing it. You have to also seek out spiritual guides. You have to look at people who are ahead of you on the path so that you can follow their example. Because trying to do this on your own is very difficult. It's very difficult to, to, to try to do this on your own. And then you also don't want to look for those shortcuts, right? If you are intending to go on a path and you're, you want to really experience the journey, then you can't just be looking for loopholes, right? And there are, of course, that paths of ease that are within our Sharia and fiqh that are meant to facilitate certain circumstances. But if you at the very onset of your journey are already looking to try to seek out the paths of ease, then you're not really up for the for the arduous path ahead. And you should be, because this is what is going to fortify you. So foregoing those dispensations and then organizing one's time, this is how we get to proper conduct. And then the last point that we talked about, um, which uh, was to suspect the nafs, right? And so these are the ways that we um, get to proper conduct. Um, and then, sorry, let me just check here. Okay, I think I, I didn't, I apologize. I'm looking at this here. I didn't get a chance to edit the bottom levels here. So hold on to that. Don't, don't, um, don't, uh, don't look at that yet because this is really what the next level should be. So just ignore that bottom level because this is what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so today we're going to look at how to cure the soul sickness because if you want to get to proper conduct, if you want to do all the things we just talked about, right, which is seek knowledge, keeping spiritual guides, foregoing dispensations, organizing time, and then suspecting the nafs, you have to be mindful of your own delusions, of your own spiritual diseases and afflictions. So he's giving us these all of these insights uh, so that we really are doing this right, right? We're really addressing um, our, our needs in, in a correct, organized, structured manner. So I just wanted to share this and you feel free for those of you who are here to just quickly snapshot any of these and, and I'll share them again, but I'm gonna now flip over to the document because I just wanted to you know, kind of bring us all back to where we left off last time so that we can now read together about the uh, spiritual sicknesses. So at the bottom of page 10 here, so we have the PDF open, let me zoom in here so that you can see. Uh, we start this section, right? The foundations of what will cure the sickness of the soul are five. So now this is a new level, right? This is the level of, of pur purifying the heart or the soul. So the first thing he mentions is quite relevant because we're still in the month of Ramadan, is moderation achieved by lightening the stomach's intake of food and drink. So subhanAllah, you see now that this is all, you know, and I'm, for those, of course, who are familiar with, with other um, teachings like those of Imam al-Ghazali and others, this connection of spiritual strength and the appetites is very well known. And it, this isn't exclusive to Islam either. Many other religious traditions have, you know, um, have uh, acts that involve uh, abstaining that uh, have acts uh, that involve restraint, right? Uh, the uh, the Catholics, of course, we know they have certain periods where they fast. We have um, other traditions as well, the Buddhists, the Hindus, they have a tradition of fasting and just being able to really uh, not give in to every appetite. And there's a great reason because when we are um, diminishing, right, the power of the nafs, then that allows for what to emerge, Right, think of it that way. It's kind of like we have these two oppositional forces within us, which are our nafs, the appetite of soul, right, which which calls us to all of our base desires, and then you have the aql and the 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 ruh that was that's created to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the higher form of of our being that's constantly looking to draw closer to Allah, and they are really working uh, oppositionally. And so when we suppress the lower nafs, when we're not giving into our food and our drink and our sexual appetites and our sleep, although sleep is necessary, of course, because we need it to function, but we're not indulging. And there's a difference there, right? When you're indulging and you just don't want to get out of bed because you want to 
be on TikTok all day or just you're pretending to sleep, right? Sometimes people delude themselves uh, to these things uh, because they just want to basically veg, as they say. These uh, this can uh, this can really um, prevent us from achieving a lot spiritually speaking, right? So when we're suppressing all those things, when we give into those things, that's what I mean. But when we suppress those things, when we don't give into the lower nafs, then what happens is we find ourselves suddenly having much more energy, much more um, himma, as they say, right? Which is ambition or aspiration. We feel that that this this desire to to do more, and then. From the efforts that we give, and of course in this month, uh, the month of Ramadan, Allah, out of his uh, generosity, will um, expand time, right? The dilation of time. So you suddenly find yourself just being able to produce more and have also other benefits like the clarity of mind, right? How many of us uh, experience that? So the, the to, to really achieve moderation, which is, um, you know, temperance, ifa, the ability to know when is enough right? It's, this is a virtue. It's a, one of the cardinal virtues, but it's the ability to just really not indulge beyond your needs is something that requires practice because by, by nature, we want more, right? We're very nafsi beings and nafsi being that we want to constantly indulge these appetites. That is the default setting of the human being. So we have to work to moderation and that's where, where fasting becomes incredibly useful to actually get to that level, right? And we, we're given this month where it's required of us, but subhanAllah, like with everything, and this is the, the sad state of the human being is that we cannot see the immense benefits of what, even what, what Allah requires of us to do, all of it benefits us. You know, it's not, and human beings are different, right? When you have certain tasks or work that you have to do that feels forced, you know, or is you have to do it like for, for your employer or for school. Um, those things can really feel weighty because they're arbitrarily sometimes given based on the, you know, the, the individual who's dictating, right? So individuals, we can sometimes, um, you know, not always uh, uh, um, delegate or, or, or give, um, you know, instructions on certain you know, whether it's to children, students, or other people that are necessarily always going to be beneficial to them. We we can sometimes, because we're humans, we make mistakes, right? So our ability to uh, necessarily be able to, you know, um, to, to, to um, require of others uh, things that are, are always going to be beneficial isn't, that's not guaranteed. Whereas with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single thing, every single thing that he expects of us to do is always beneficial, consistently beneficial. Our prayers, our fasts, our Quran recitation, everything we do, it's not a chore that would in any way bring harm, right? It's all because it's all been determined by our creator who obviously knows what we need. So he knows best what is in our best interest. That, that's why we have to really show immense gratitude that that our Lord is, is you know, he's giving us this opportunity in this month of Ramadan where he has made it, you know, a fard, it's a pillar of Islam to fast, right? It's not optional because he wants us to go against ourselves, right? Uh, if it wasn't fard, how many of us would fast? We, we wouldn't. If we had the option to fast or not, most of us would not fast. I, I can guarantee it. I'll, I'll speak first about my own self. I'd probably find ways to get out of it because it's optional. But the fact that it's far, you know, we got to do it. We and we're believers, we're committed. We do it, but then subhanAllah, we reap the benefits. So this is our generous Lord. He makes it required for that reason, right? Or what that's one of the reasons, so that we can see for ourselves. And then of course the rewards that he has waiting for us. I mean, there's just so much abundance there. But the point is that moderation in in, in will will help us to to cure our diseases. But in order to become moderate, we have to do certain things. So that's where fasting becomes an incredible tool. The next point of getting, you know, uh, mastery over the nafs and purifying the nafs of these diseases is to be vigilant about places where one fears that they are going to make mistakes. So this requires some brutal honesty with yourself. Like you, we all know that there are certain people that may pull us into haram. We all know that there are certain places and environments that when we go to, we suddenly get a little too loose, 
you know, um, sometimes because of familiarity of just closeness of comfort level, we lose comportment, we lose other, we lose the vigilance over ourselves, and we may start to do certain things that we wouldn't normally do uh, or by ourselves or in other settings, right? And so that's why we have to be very careful. Like if you know, if you had, for example, like let's say when you were in your high school, college days, you had a period of, you know, jahiliya, like we call it, right? Like a period of ignorance, um, uh, you know, you did certain things that maybe you're not proud of, but you had your a partner in crime to do it with, right? You had someone who was um, there with you and you guys did things together. That person now, unless they've reformed and, and you've reformed and you've really truly made toba, can become dangerous to you, right? If you have kind of started to go in a different direction and that person is not at the same level, right? Maybe they're not there yet and Allah guides whomever he wills. But you leave the door open to maintain um, a friendship with this individual, knowing that you kind of have this history with them and there could be uh, a relapse, you're risking your own soul, right? So you have to have the presence of mind to know that as much as that person, maybe you care for them and you should, we shouldn't cut people off. We should certainly not think ourselves as better than those when we, um, if we've kind of achieved a certain, you know, spiritual um like we're, we're, we're being drawn spiritually, we should never let ourselves think uh, of ourselves as being better than others, but we should just be honest and say, I'm weak still, right? I'm vulnerable. I could easily relapse if I'm with this person or go to this environment. You know, maybe if you're on a college campus this is a perfect scenario I've had, because I work with college students, I've had this, you know, issue come up of, you know, non-Muslim uh, uh, friends, classmates who are really nice people and you get along with them but they always want to invite you to like party kind of environments, you know? And I, I recently actually had this question from a brother who was like, how do you deal with that? You know, like you want to maintain a friendship with these classmates that you've forged bonds with, but they always want to invite you to scenes that you know are not right for you as a Muslim. How do you find balance? And this is where boundary setting is really important. If you allow yourself to let your emotions dictate to you, then what you're going to do is say, oh, I don't want to be perceived as a bad friend and I don't want to be ungrateful or, or make this person feel bad. I'll just go, right? But when you're trying to fortify yourself without you know, any um, real concrete, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, established practice that would, that is so far removed from, from that kind of behavior, then you risk relapsing or falling into sinfulness, right? Like if you're, if, if a person, for example, is practicing their deen, inshallah, for 10, 15, 20 years, and they're pretty, you know, they have um, that strength and that fortitude, uh, likely those environments would never even tempt them. They would never even go. There's just no question about it. But a, a very young you know, um, person on the path, young, not by age, but like a seeker who's relatively, you know, new on the path has to be very careful not to allow that door to remain open and then to walk through it because it just takes, um, the nafs is so weak that in that case, when you haven't built that fortification, you could easily be called, right? Like the siren call, as they say, of sinfulness or, or sinful behavior. It kind of puts people under a spell. Like you go to an environment with all your um, peers and there's a lot of peer pressure, as we say, but also you're, you're an, a young adult, uh, you know, hormonal uh, teenager, let's just say, if that's the, the context. And you go to an environment where like your nuffs is literally being catered to everywhere you go, your eyes uh, are, are able to look at things that you sh normally would not see, your appetites are being, um, you know, enticed, it's too much, it, it's sensory overload, and next thing you know, um, you may fall into sinfulness, and once you cross a line with, like, doing a, a severe haram act that you know is haram, it's a very slippery slope, because shaitan is now he is relentless. Once he has a person in his grip, when he's got them to do something they've never done before. So the, the, the first experience, right, um, of, of drinking alcohol, the first experience of smoking weed, the first experience of touching um, a, a man or a woman that's not lawful to you and actually doing things with that person becomes a source 
with which he will continue to work the, the individual down, right? He will continue to entice you and also spiritually shame you to the point where you may think, what's the point of, you know, I'm too, uh, you feel so guilty and you feel so terrible and have so much self-loathing that you start to distance yourself from the path and even from, you know, the spiritual friends or, or, or company that you may have that were on the opposite side completely because you feel so disgusted with yourself. And sometimes we, we wear that shame externally. So we feel like everybody can see it. Then we avoid those groups. And this is exactly the path the, the you know, how Shaitan works. He gets people to uh, slowly uh, transform and slowly turn from one direction to the other. So avoiding places is really important. Um, if you want to <clears throat> to uh, remove uh, th these sicknesses. And I would say um, this is not just also restricted to physical places, because in the context of social media, there are far more places we traverse that are haram from the social media perspective than we um, than physical spaces, I would say, the far more, because at the access, the access is so easy. You know, with the, with the touch of a finger, you can go down the most demonic uh, pathways possible. Um, now, it's very simple. And that's why people are ruined. Uh, many people become ruined, uh, spiritually speaking, because it took a button, it took a, um, a you know, a click, and then all of a sudden, they're, they're down a very, very, very dark path. So when we say avoiding vigilantly places where one fears misdeeds occur, understand that there's multiple iterations of that. It's physical, it's uh, virtual, it's it's individuals, it's not just places, but also people that could also call us to sinfulness. So that's the second point. The third is to see yourself in a state of perpetual humility, right? Perpetual humility, because that then forces you to always, you know, ask Allah subhanahu for forgiveness, right? Continuously asking Allah for forgiveness, coupled with devotional prayers upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in both solitude and gatherings of people. And I love that he puts those conditions, because, you know, making the tawbah or um, doing salawat, right, when it's in front of people, can lead to uh, what we would call riya, right? Which are, uh, which is which is performing spiritual acts for the the sake of just being seen, right? Ostentation. You want people to see you. And sometimes when we're in certain gatherings, right? If you're sitting in a thick of a circle, you're in a masjid, like you know, last night, last night was a qiyam. All we all, inshallah, some of us were on virtual qiyam, some of us are in physical qiyams, whatever the case is. If you're participating in something and people can see you, and you're just kind of going with the motions. Um, it's easy to do because it serves, you know, the nafs. In some cases, people are oblivious to these things, but it, you like the um, the feeling, right, of being part of the jama, part of the group, and so the intentions can be sometimes compromised. Whereas when we're doing these things separate from people's eyes and view, and just completely independent, this is where we really are showing our sincerity. So Toba. Um, and uh, I mean, a perfect example is Toba in a gathering where everybody's, you know, saying together in unison, like, right? These are all things that we could be doing in unison in a group. Do we really think that's the same at the same level? And of course, every individual heart is different, but I'm just kind of drawing a parallel. Would you say that that would be the same as a person who is in their own private quarters, not a single soul in sight? And they are shedding tears for remorse before their creator. They're, this isn't about anybody else. This is about true remorse to their creator, true remorse. Or is it the same if we're all in a gathering and there's a you know kind of nice um, uplifting setting where everybody's doing salawat and the Prophet says him and we're all kind of just sharing that moment together. Is that the same as a person who is in every waking moment, whether they're dri driving or they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're walking, they're cleaning, they're doing something um, of benefit, but they're, there's nobody else that, around. And then they remember, you know what? I want to do salawat on my Prophet Sallallahu because he, his entire life, right, was for me, for me to benefit from. And I, I, I owe it to, to him to at least, to, to at, le at the very least offer my words of gratitude by sending the, the salam upon him right? So you just do that from your own heart. It's not about just being 
a participant in a group activity. It's about you demonstrating your true love and devotion to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that, they're very different. And I think we can all agree to that. So that's why these conditionals that Sidi Ahmed Zidur puts are so important because he's reminding us to purify our devotion, not just to do it in the context of it being done with others. And, and yes, there's still benefit and merit to that. We don't wanna disconnect from our community, but to actually do it independent of that as well. Be consistent, be real, right? So being in a state of toba consistently will help you to not want to continuously, what? Transgress the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the wisdom, right? That you are continuously mindful of your sinfulness in the past so that you prevent yourself from falling into further sin. And then doing salawat and the Prophet Sallallahu is in the same vein by witnessing his blessings upon you and not wanting to disappoint him, right? Because inshallah, we're all, we should all seek that when the, on the day of judgment, inshallah, when we're all gathered and we're all running around, you know, it's going to be pandemonium. It's chaos, the, the fear that strikes the, the, the human being in that day. But what we find is our ummah, we're blessed in that we all are, are, are sought, seeking um, our Prophet Sallallahu but he's also seeking us. He's looking out for us. And how does he know us, right? How does he know us? He knows us by the marks of our wudu, by the limbs that are literally uh, uh, luminescent, right? They're, li they're lit up. Um, uh, because of our wudu. So he will be seeking us and we will be seeking him, but we should seek to not be those who disappoint him, right? So this is where the wisdom of doing the tawbah coupled with the salawat, where in both solitude and gatherings of people is so, so profound, mashallah. And then, uh, so the fourth um, or the fifth, excuse me, point here is keeping company with one who guides to Allah and then this is, you know, Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, he's, he's, he's making a comment here. He says, unfortunately, such a, no one, such a one no longer exists. And he's talking about, you know, the, the 15th century, um, where in his time, he's witnessing this idea of a single spiritual master or guide was, uh, was fading. It was, it was just not, they, they, were, they, they weren't in existence then. So what about now? And I think this is an important point because there are charlatans. There are people who uh, who uh, pose as being spiritual guides, but they actually have ulterior motives. So I think, you know, he's, he's making a recommendation, but also warning that not to fall for just anybody. And then there's more as we read. Um, uh, we'll continue to read. You'll see where he's going with this. Right. So now he pivots a little bit and he speaks specifically about Abu Hassan Shadri. Uh, Rahimullah, who said what? And this is the counsel that he gave. So it's in the same context. And he says, my beloved counseled me not to put my feet anywhere except where I hoped for Allah's reward. So we just talked about avoiding places where one fears misdeeds. And now this is a beautiful pairing to that, right? Don't go anywhere if you don't feel that there will be reward for you. Why even go? What's the point? What's the point of going if there's no reward? So this is the counsel, right? And then not to sit anywhere except where I was safe from disobedience to Allah. So watching the gatherings, watching the company that you keep, not to accompany anyone except someone in whom I could find support in obedience to Allah. So if you're going to hang out with people, you're going to go travel with people, you're going to work with people, but they do not call you to obedience of Allah, you know, um, even marriage, like I'm just, um, subhanAllah, it's sad because you hear so often these cases of divorce just popping up every single day. I was, you know, watching um, a qiyam last night where du'as were coming in. There was like a, just people were asking for du'as and several of them were, please make du'a for the sister, uh, divorce two kids, you know, brother divorced, 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 divorced. And you're just like, yeah, Allah, what's happening? What's happening, you know, Allah knows, but I've worked enough to the, in the community to see that many people will completely get caught up in the superficial. You know, they'll get caught up in the looks and the attraction and the emotions, the tension that they feel with a, with a potential mate, you know, uh, they get caught up in the attention that they're getting. 
So if you're lonely, you're feeling insecure and someone suddenly comes along and fills you with all the compliments in the world, you love it. You love the way they make you feel, right? That's all nafs. Your nafs is completely taken hold of you because if your rational mind was activated, you would realize that human beings use people, you know, people will say whatever to get whatever they want. They'll say a lot of things. They'll tell, they'll lie to your face. <laughs> and, you know, it's just the way that the nature of the, the human being is in order to get something out of you. And many people do that in order to get something, they'll, they'll flood people, right? Love bombing is a very real thing that predatory people do. So it's not um, something to necessarily uh, be impressed by, but rather to be suspicious of, especially when it's done quickly, you know, someone you barely know, and all of a sudden they're making all these promises to you and they're, you know, giving you all these, just, you have to have the, the reasoning to know, wait a second, something doesn't seem right here. And this is where our Dean is constantly warning us. How do you do that? You look at character. You don't look at the superficial. You don't look at a person, how attractive they are, how, um, you know, the words that they use, how, how uh, charming they are. Those are not the criteria for, uh, for marriage, right? Or for, for drawing close to people, uh, how wealthy they are. But this is what we've come to now where these things matter much more. A person gets completely infatuated with someone just because of the clothing they wear. Like I know people that that's what it was. It was like, I love the way they dress. I love the swag they had. Swag? So your criteria to give your soul and heart and body and mind to someone because was because they dressed in brand name clothing and you don't see there's an issue with that. And the reason why I mention this is because look at the advice here, right? Not to accompany anyone except someone in whom I could find support and obedience to Allah. If the person who you are going to give your entire being to is not calling you to be in obedience to Allah, what are you doing? Right? How do you possibly expect to have khair? How do you possibly expect to see good come out of a relationship like that when the person doesn't obey their Lord? And for women, I'll say this because I really feel like we need to warn our sisters. If he doesn't fear his Lord, what on what basis do you have any assurance that he will give you your rights? It's, it's a very big risk to marry someone who doesn't display taqwa. And if you get caught up with the physical attraction and all the other superficial things and forget that taqwa is the most important quality in a companion, let alone a partner in life, uh, then you will learn a very difficult lesson. And I think we're, that's what we're seeing with the rise of divorce is that people let their emotions dictate to them, but then they realize in order to sustain a relationship, I need to have someone with a conscience, right? I need to have someone who understands what fairness is, what justice is, what rights are, what balance is, what compassion is. And that can't be in the heart. That's not, um, it can't, it, it doesn't exist. Those things can't exist in a heart that's completely heedless of, of, of their Lord. So you just can't have your cake and eat it too, as they say. You need to prioritize. But I find it important that he mentions this. And then he says, and not select anyone for myself other than those who increase my certainty and how rare are they to find. There you go. Don't shortchange yourself in any regards, you know, um, whether it's friendship. And I, again, this is just something to mention. So many people I know are, um, they have quote unquote friends that are really harmful to them, but they don't, they still continue to maintain those relationships. If people are not benefiting you and they're causing you harm, they're stressing you out, they give you anxiety, you panic when you see their phone come in, you feel restricted and constricted every time you're around them. What are you doing? Have ghayda for yourself. Have ghayda for your heart. Your heart is special. It was you know, created to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead of knowing Allah, it's being consumed with all this, you know, with all this toxicity of dunya. And, and it's not because the dunya's just got in 
It's because we let it in, right? So we have to protect our heart. We have to stand vigilant. So that's, you know, the counsel is just to be very mindful of where you go, who you spend your time with, and, and really protect your own interests, protect your heart. He also said, may Allah be pleased with them, whoever directs you. Now the opposite of this, right? Whoever directs you to this world, right, has cheated you. So when people are telling you to, you know, give into your nafs and, and just forget your spiritual religious obligations, what's the big deal? Your heart is pure. I've heard people say that to me, literally, I'll take your sin for you. Just let's, let's go. Don't worry about it. I, you know, God is the most merciful. Our hearts are clean, but I'll take it for you. <laughs> I mean, that's like the height of, of real, not only arrogance, but also ignorance because we, we should never feel so safe, right? Nobody should ever feel safe. And then he goes on to say, so whoever directs you to this world has cheated you. Whoever directs you to deeds has exhausted you, right? And then, but whoever directs you to Allah has truly counseled you. So we have sometimes people who push us towards actions, right? Whether they're worldly or otherworldly um, without really directing us to Allah. And that's important because sometimes, you know, people get again too preoccupied with the external or the outward, but the heart matters and whether the sincerity matter, matters. So the true companion in this life, the true person that you want to um, spend time with, whether it's a teacher, um, a spouse, a partner, a friend, whoever it is, is the one who's constantly directing you to Allah, right? who's constantly uh, trying to remind you of your relationship with your Lord. It's not about them, right? And I'll say this, for example, like parents, when I do parenting sessions, I'm always, I try to remind parents that our role as parents is to you know, give our children the necessary tools and all of the, the you know, the, the tarbiyah that they need in order to navigate this world. But at a certain point, we have to get out of the way, right? We are in there because, you know, it's kind of like when you, you have a toddler and you're, you're teaching them to walk, right? What do we do? We usually hold their hands and we walk backwards while they walk forwards with us because we want to hold their hand and guide them in the direction, the correct direction. And we are in the path. We're right in front of them, right? This is how all of us taught our children how to walk. Or we stand and we, we, we uh, incentivize them to come to us, right? But we're in their way. And they love us so much, they uh, want to draw close to us. So they come and they start to walk, subhanAllah. That's kind of like metaphor for life, right? For the instruction of a parent. We do that. But at a certain point, we have to get out of the way. And this is really the difficult part for a lot of parents because we get so comfortable with the dutifulness of our children. Um, we get so comfortable with their devotion and love to us. And we want them to constantly acknowledge us and, you know, be mindful of all the things we do for them that we sometimes realize we are an obstacle for them spiritually, because if we could redirect or, or kind of slowly phase out and just leave and, and turn everything back to Allah uh, we we're, we're going to help them a lot more. So it's you know it's really about trying to do that in the most in every situation is just constantly direct uh, to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for ourselves and, and our children and whoever else. But the the company that we keep that's what the best company is. Those who are like, Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah it's all from Allah it's all from Allah it's not me it's not you we're in blessing we're in nitma because of Allah that's it that's the 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 person or the people that you want to keep company with. And then um, he says here, and I'll, we'll close out with this. He also said, may Allah be pleased with him. Make piety, taqwa, your abode. So beautiful, so simple, so succinct. Make your home, your, your place that you reside in, right? Uh, taqwa. And the delight of your selfish soul will do you no harm. So long as it is discontent with its faults, and does not persist in acts of disobedience, nor abandons the awareness of Allah in solitude. This is the formula, right? Your nafs will not uh, continue to wreak havoc on you uh, if you can maintain taqwa and make sure that what? That it's aware of its faults, right? So when we talked before about being suspicious of the soul, that's uh, very important to have that mind, uh, to, to be aware of that always, to be vigilant. 
that your nafs, that which resides within you, should be con- always um, suspect. You know, they have that word now uh, when they when you want to say something is suspicious, it's sus. <laughs> The nafs is very sus. It's always going to be sus. It will always push us uh, to, to just indulge and to do things um, that, that are going to take us backwards, right? So be, be always mindful of that and don't let it ever become too content with itself, which we're going to get to soon, right? About this idea of being content with oneself. Uh, it is a sign of spiritual disease. And also, obviously, I mean, it's obvious do not uh, continue in acts of disobedience. So whatever whatever haram you're doing, at a certain point, you've got to wake up and say, what am I doing? It's like you're, you're self-harming. You know, we, we, we gasp when we hear of people self-harming, right? <gasps> the teenagers are self-harming. They're cutting themselves. Everybody's like, <gasps> but in reality, all of us are, you know, ruh harming or nafs harming, whatever you want to call it. We are harming our soul and we're harming our body too. I mean, it's all harm, but we are harming the most, our, the, the most essential part of who we are, which is our spiritual heart, our, our self in, in that way, our, our soul. We're all doing it in this way. So disobedience has to be, you have to come make a break. Like I'm not going to be actively disobeying a lot. It's one thing when you do something accidentally or you're not aware of something, but to actively be doing haram, aware of it, and then not even uh, feeling guilt over it. You've kind of just resigned yourself that it's just who I am. It's just part of who I am. It's just what I do. This is this has to stop. And we all have to make toba from that. And then the last point he makes to also be aware of Allah in solitude. And this is full circle, right? Because we started off with that, the foundation. The first one is taqwa with Allah in private and in public. And solitude, the dhikr of Allah in solitude, far, far outstrips and outweighs the performative the good that we may do in the company of other people um just being mindful of Allah when we're completely by ourselves and that's an indication actually of who we truly are what are we doing when we're alone right if you're alone no one else is there no one else is watching you what are you doing it, it tells you a lot of what you need to know where you are and the final thing he says I say that being content here it is with the self persisting in disobedient acts and abandoning awareness of Allah are the foundations of all illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls. SubhanAllah. So it's like, a, these are, by the way, the words of Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, because those were counsels from Imam Shadri, but now these are his words again. And you can just see by the font. So this is a cliffhanger that I'm going to leave you all on for next week. We're going to continue, inshallah, these sessions until we finish this text. I'm grateful to the Rahma Foundation because initially this was supposed to be for Ramadan, but I realized that this is such a rich document. It's not going to be able to, um, I'm not going to do it justice doing it in three or four sessions. So inshallah, we're going to continue. But that cliffhanger, we're going to leave you all with and just think about it deeply, right? He's, these are, he's not equivocating his words here. He's very clear here that all illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls come from these things, right? The self being too content with it, perpetual or persistent disobedience, and completely abandoning awareness of Allah, those three things. And we all have to answer, you know, eventually, but let's examine ourselves now. So let me stop here, and I'll take some questions, if there are any, inshallah, before we close out. Alhamdulillah. Assalamualaikum. Thank you again for another wonderful class. So you mean uh, telling you all about how little sleep I got last night and how good I'm feeling today is not the path, not the spiritual <laughs> path. <laughs> no, we can do that. It's just uh, <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's like the the Facebook morning um, statuses. Exactly. All oh, those days. It's so funny when you look back on what what were we all thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Every moment of our day was a status. Subhanallah. Mashallah. All right. So this first question says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. When you mention sincerity and difference to social and family pressures and pleasing the creator and not the creation, what about wishing someone a happy birthday? No cake. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these are like, you know, out of questions. Um, from my understanding, you know, it really comes down to like these types of cultural customs, like in some cultures, Birthdays are a really big deal. So if you're marrying into a family or you maybe you come from a family 
where this was just a custom. Um, I don't think there's anything harmful about it as far as I've, from my teachers that we've learned. Um, so these are, you know, not things that we should preoccupy or, or get too caught up in because it's just, it's out of its culture. Whereas, um, you know, there are other opinions that are very strict about these things, but I feel like that causes sometimes more harm. Like I've seen people have, you know, disputes, family disputes. And if you really think about it, just wishing someone a simple happy birthday should not cause problems, right? But if people become sticklers on certain things and then they politicize or make things, you know, everything about haram and halal and bid'ah and, and it turns into this big debate issue, it just causes uh, these problems in the hearts. And that I think would be far worse. So uh, it's not a, I, I don't think, you know, it's a big deal. Again, I'm, this isn't my opinion. This is what our teachers have taught that those types of things don't make issues out of it, inshallah. And just have the best of intentions that you're doing certain things to bring the hearts together. All right, thank you. Uh, so how do we best identify our attachment to food? When should we realize how culture and environment inform our desires? Any best practices? Huh, that's a good question. So I think, you know, you know, I had a friend who, who used to say, you know, it might be actually a popular quote, but I just remember she would say it often that we fuel is a food is a fuel, right? And we should live, uh, live to eat. No, eat to live, I'm sorry, eat to live, not live to eat, right? Because of the culture we're in today lives to eat. They're obsessed with food, preoccupied with food. And, you know, there is, there are, there's the hadith that talks about, you know, the lack of barakah. When food doesn't have barakah, then you have an insatiable appetite, right? And so this is where it's all connected. Um, but I think if you're just consumed, uh, which is ironic that we use that word, buy food because we consume food. But if you're consumed by it, you're waking up, you're thinking about it, you're dreaming about it, you're like constantly obsessed. Like I was uh, teasing um, someone I know recently that on Facebook, we have one of the most probably active Facebook groups I've ever seen uh, here in the Bay Area is called Bay Area Food Halal Ease, I think, or something. I'm, I'm, I think I'm on it, but I'm not really on it. But I just, I see posts and people send me stuff and I'm like, wow, this, this is such an active group. And man, mashallah, I wish we had this level of um, interaction on other, you know, uh, groups that are maybe more intellectual. And I get it, people, you know, especially during month of Ramadan, they're hungry. So it's, it's kind of, it's natural to do that. But I feel like if that becomes like your life where you're just like browsing through menus and, and looking at different restaurants all the time and you just want to eat, 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 there's some, there's definitely a problem there. You have to work on breaking the um, that hold that food has over you. And food is enjoyable. It's it's a great nama that we've been given, but I think this is where practicing restraint and creating a a, an independence from food, you know, uh, is really important. Like seeing your your um, your patterns, right? Is it certain types of food, or is it just the entire, you know, topic of food that excites you? Because uh, there are uh, certain, you know, we we uh, we can certainly get addicted to certain foods, right? And if you look at the um, quality of our food and the properties of our food, they're designed to be addictive. So sometimes it's not even a person's actively seeking these things. They're just consuming things that are affecting their brain chemistry or their physiology. And they don't even know that they've created these, um, these addictions or these food dependencies. So there's so much there, but I think if, if the bottom line is if your mind is constantly thinking about food, there may be something to explore there because and I want to be um, sensitive to also people who have had really difficult lives and food became a source of comfort. I remember a friend of mine who had severe you know, trauma as a child. Um, I mean, really severe, all the things that I, they're, they're made of nightmares that she, you know, she had gained a lot of weight and she said it was completely intentional. She hated her body so much that she, actively ate a lot. And I, there, are, that's a reality. There are people who consume themselves because of real severe trauma. So I don't think it's fair to just speak of these things as being, you know, somehow a person's weak. It's more just paying attention to your mind, whether or not the preoccupation is coming from something that may be more, you know, you would need to explore more from a mental health perspective, or if it's just, um, 
a, an enjoyable pleasure that you like indulging in that is distracting you a little bit too much, you know? I knew someone who was stick thin. I mean, this is it's, it's weird because, you know, we can't predict it, these things. Someone who is really, mashallah, so thin, like maybe less than 100 pounds, but loved food to the point that their refrigerator was, I, I would say it was like pregnant with food. Like you couldn't open it without something falling out. And they said themselves, like their eye was bigger than they could consume. They didn't eat a lot. They ate like birds. They like, like the portions were so small, but they loved the idea of food. And, you know, these, again, could, there could be other implications, all of those, but I think each of us are going to have to examine our relationship with food from that perspective, because um, I've been, you know, much less the fadwa, we've all, you know, maybe some of you have been on this call, have been around like really spiritually people who've mastered these things. I, I'm in awe. They eat like nothing, but subhanAllah, they look fully nourished. It's not like they look emaciated. They just, food is not interesting to them and they eat to, uh, to live. It's a, it's a fuel. Um, and that's very possible. I, I mean, I'll just share this with you because I actually, from our teachers being around them, I was so amazed by their ability to restrain themselves. We would have these lavish, you know, meals sometimes because people would host and everybody's just pouring it on. And then there's dessert and chai. And you would look at their plate and it was like a date, a small little morsel and water and everybody's drinking soda. And this is, it's just, it was a scene, but I would just look at them and go, subhanAllah, what kind of strength do they have? You know, and I actually, this is a true story. It happened to me when I went to Hajj back in December of 2004, long, long time ago, this was my dua on Arafah. I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I said, please, Ya Allah, give me the ability to completely uh, restrict my food intake and have complete mastery over like my my nafs so that food is not interesting to me like I can I can basically I wanted to have what they had and I so I put that dua out there and subhanallah it was amazing because Allah completely answered that dua and you know those of who know me personally know I went through a period before I had children where I lost a lot of weight and part of the weight loss was me literally forgetting to eat I just cut off my shahwa completely. It was cut off. I, I went entire days. Allah is my witness. Wallahi, I would have maybe one cucumber. There was a couple of days I didn't eat, but I wasn't even interested. I was drinking water, but I had no desire for food. And, you know, I would go to girls' parties, halakas, there was dessert plates, everything, brownies, everything that you could want. You know, women usually go for the desserts, men go for the meat. We know that. <laughs> but I was completely unfazed. I had no desire. So it is very possible. These are spiritual things. Allah can turn your heart off from these things. Alhamdulillah. Um, so I've lived it. I know it's real. May Allah give us that fortitude and strength to not be enslaved by our desires. Inshallah. Ameen. Alhamdulillah. Sorry, there's uh, I, I give these long answers. I apologize. I hope we're no, not. we're fine. It, it's like cows, you know, they just eat grass and they become these massive beasts. And it's not like they go around looking for something else. Right. You know, but it's part of us that we have these shahwas and so there's so much variety in the food that we can eat. That's and it's right. just, it is, it's a path. It's just one of the paths that you can take to really train yourself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. There is one more question if you have time for sure, it. I do. Absolutely. So this one, this person asks, we're new parents and my husband always blames me for everything that happens to the baby. Example, the baby has eczema and it's my fault. How do I stay positive without having bad thoughts about my husband? Yeah, Allah, that's really difficult. I'm sorry to hear that. It's not your fault. You know, it's not for Allah. Um, sometimes men really want control or, or um, I mean, I shouldn't say that they want control, but I, I want, what I mean to say is a man, especially a husband, a young father, the way that Allah subhanahu wa has created our men folk is that they have so much uh, responsibility. They're constantly bearing this weight of being responsible, right, for um, their family. And 
a new child, a new baby, an infant, so vulnerable, right? As soon as something doesn't go the way that would be ideal, the father may feel that he has somehow failed, but it's, you know, a lot easier sometimes to scapegoat uh, because to deal with, to confront or to accept that maybe, you know, you uh, somehow miss something is painful for some people. So that's where a lot of this blame and shift goes between spouses, especially. And young children bring a lot of tension and stress for that reason. But I think open communication is really important. And what I would encourage is to always kind of, especially as you're learning, right? I mean, you have a new baby. This is a learning uh, phase for both of you. Not You don't get a, like a handbook on how to do this. But I do think the more you show and demonstrate that you are ahead of these things, like making sure doctor's appointments are scheduled in advance, giving um, reports, you know, of daily things so that he feels like he knows what's going on, it will actually protect you from these types of um, injurious, you know, accusations. Because it's it hurts the hurtful, right? You're the young mom, you're with this baby all day, taking care of it, tending to it, and to have someone throw an accusation like that is very, very painful. But I think um, if you think of it like from his perspective, if he at least knows what's going on, and sometimes men, because they're working, I'm assuming you're home with the child and he's out, he doesn't know, right, what's going on. And we as women, sometimes we're so spent, we don't think of the importance of actually sharing all of the daily stuff. Because sometimes it gets so you know repetitive, like, oh, okay, every time I change a diaper, I have to tell them no. But it's more like, Anything that you notice or observe, or just even checking in, like when I was married uh, with my, I mean, when my kids were younger, and um, uh, you know, we were in Southern California uh, with my with my husband, I would just update him, send pictures constantly, keeping him in the loop is what I'm trying to say. Because if you keep him in the loop and he knows what's going on, it's kind of like you're submitting these reports periodically. Then he'll feel some sense of like control, right? But if he's absent in the day it doesn't really have much to do with the 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 day in day out stuff of parent of uh, you know taking care of the the child then it will be very easy for him as soon as something goes wrong to be like it's your fault right so i think being a, a kind of getting into the team mindset as a mom uh, is really important that yes i'm doing the bulk work uh, of this you know of of the child you know taking care of the child but i can at least bring him into the loop so that he feels we are a team in this. I'm doing this part. He's, uh, you know, going out and, um, you know, getting, um, you know, I mean, working and, and bringing uh, the sustenance for the family to be sustained. We're, we are a team. We just aren't communicating. And I think in the absence of that communication, these things happen. And then fear sets in, panic sets in, blame shifts, and it's just all this ugliness. So try that, try being more open and more communicative, giving him those little reports, inshallah, and don't, um, don't let your heart turn from him. It's out of love and concern, uh, but obviously he's not emotionally managing himself well because he, he's blaming you, but I think you can, inshallah, help to turn that around by just having a little bit more clear communication with him. And also, as I said, being on top of those appointments and kind of reading and sharing articles on certain things that involve the baby it shows your proactivity and he can't then uh, blame you for for being you know for missing something because you've been actively doing that i hope that makes sense inshallah uh thank you I, sometimes i think too the you know when um when maybe men are working in a professional sphere and they're used to that sort of having to assign blame mm -hmm. to somebody on the team because things didn't go right. Yep. Um, and then they try to bring that home. You know, it doesn't necessarily work. <laughs> I mean, obviously it doesn't work. And so that may be, and they're both new. That, that That's the thing they have to remember. She has to remember you're both new at this parenting. And it's really important that you allow each other to have time. So just like she would like time to sort of learn about the best care for her baby, she should also give her husband that time to learn to be a father in the way that um, he can and with his other responsibilities and with her other responsibilities. So it's interesting to, to see these new parents for those of us who have been around a while. We know it's, these are just the easy days of <laughs> dealing with the babies, but um, you know, it's important at the beginning, I think too, to just have that relationship and use, you, you know, use your words, of course. 
Absolutely. And not let Shaitan come between you two. Because he's that's what he will continuously do. He'll find these ways. Oh, he's blaming me. No, just be like, you know what? He's a dad. He's worried about his baby. He's not handling it right. This is stressful. We're both lacking sleep. We've never done this before. It's hard for both of us. But I can, you know, show that, um, you know, like I said, be proactive and really for the sake of the family, I try to make these little adjustments. Inshallah, Allah will give you tawfiq. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Please uh, close us up with a dua. And then inshallah, we'll be back to Monday schedule next week. Is that correct? Yes, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. And thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you. Please support the Rahma Foundation, by the way, for those who are uh, you know, joining and, and benefiting from these classes. Inshallah, they try to make so much programming available for women and young girls all over the world. And I really, they didn't ask me to say this, but I really wish and pray in these last Mubarak days and nights of, of uh, Ramadan that we all do whatever we can to support this wonderful organization. It is on my top uh, list of organizations and they know, Sada Fado knows, um, she basically owns me. <laughs> she can, whatever she needs, I'm at her disposal on the service. But alhamdulillah, I just, because I love the mission so much and this is really, uh, if we want to protect our uh, future, and I say I don't say this lightly, I really mean this. If we want to protect our future as an ummah and as a community, then we have to support our women because the women, the woman, the mother is the first house, the first madrasa, the first school, the first uh, source of so much of of the uh, the the deen that is transmitted to the child. So we need to fortify our women folk. And our young girls, of course, to be able to handle this insane world that they're in. And then we will see the benefits of that in our household, which will reach our boys and our sons and our men, inshallah. But let us uh, invest in, in organizations like the Rahma Foundation that center women. Um, alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah khairan. With that, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasabu al-haqi wa tawasabu al-sabr. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta nistaghfirak wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Subhan rabbika rabbil aizzati amma yusifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan, everyone. Thank you again, inshallah. We will see you on Monday next week for the continuation of the foundations of the spiritual path. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.